So what we need to realize is every time you come to a church, doesn't matter which one, as long as they're preaching Jesus or preaching the word, sit under that word and let it wash you. For we are washed by the water of the word. You ready to get in the word? But we're going to call this the upward call to spiritual growth. The upward call to spiritual growth. Now you guys know, I know, you know, that we are all growing up within ourselves into Christ. Notice the phrases, we're growing up into Christ. In other words, like he's the mold, and we are growing up into that mold. Can you say amen? So inside of you, we also know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of reviewing sneakily, I'm reviewing, we also know that when we accepted Jesus, he came in like a seed. Now here's the wonderful thing, he came in perfectly. You got a perfect seed inside of you named Jesus. And that seed has to develop. Can you say amen? Now the enemy knows that. So here's what happened. When you accepted Jesus, God's nature, your nature became one. God removed the sin nature from you in your spirit man and put his nature in replace. So we become a new creature. We need to learn to walk in newness of life. So you are developing from the inside out. Now, pastors who are really wise, and there are a lot of them, by the way, recognize that it takes a while for a Christian to develop from the inside out. And they're not going to do it overnight. And so in our journey with everybody, to, you know, we're a corporate family, we're going to notice there are people that are not as far along as you are, and there are people that are much far spiritual, you think, than you are. Don't be looking at people. Remember, we've been telling you that. People are going to grow. They're going to come to know the Lord. Somebody's going to come to know the Lord tomorrow. And they're going to join this church. And they're going to be just a baby. They're going to need to see adults and mature people to bring up. Hey, village. I'm going to quote, what's her name? I don't want to mention her name. She says, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, listen, it takes a congregation to really help one another grow. God involves his body in everything he does. Now think about it. If he's the head of the body, what would happen if he did everything and the body wasn't involved? We would have a headless body. Okay, so we are connected to Jesus. So let's look at this. He dwells in us. We dwell in him. He's for us. He's with us. We're in him. He's in us. He's clothed us. He's armored us. He's given his angels. He's given us his kingdom. And then he brought the Holy Spirit, because this is where we're going to take up, to teach us how to walk the way he walked. Now, folks, that takes listening, takes a lack of pride in being humble, and it takes a real want to get to know the way, the Jesus way of life. It is exciting. I mean, so much more than the mundane life that you, we have without Christ. Now, you, you have a pretty good one. I know some of you are wonderful. But just think of what God is doing now in you. All right, so we're going to leave that as the, the premise or the foundational as we're going to launch on. Are you ready? So let me read my paragraph to you. Greetings. Today we're going to share on spiritual growth, what it means and how we are developed and matured. How we are developed, not we develop ourselves. Okay, all development now is in the spirit and comes from our heavenly father. It comes through Christ by the help of the Holy Spirit. Why? We have to be with him long enough to be trained. If so listen, if I was going to go work for Scott, Scott would have to sit me down, let me know the ropes. He would have to educate me and how things work and make sure I don't mess up. This is what God is doing with us. We've been trained in the worldly way. Some of us, I, and myself included, have lived on the street. Okay, out of my car, in the streets of Seattle for a week. Now, did I enjoy that? It was kind of interesting, but no. Okay, you see? So the world tries to educate us, tried to smash us down in, into its likeness. But thank God we have the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? 
This is where the Holy Spirit comes in. As we seek God, the Holy Spirit, our guide, he's called our helper, our guide, and our instructor goes into operation to train us how to walk in this life. Now, I don't know about you, but if you don't want to learn, you're going to learn from the school of hard knocks. How many's ever been there? Don't raise your hand. Listen, you want to know why a lot of Christians go through hard times? Because they don't listen to the Holy Spirit. They don't, maybe they don't know how. Maybe they were trained religiously. Maybe they did something wrong and they, they don't feel God has forgiven them. You see, all this lie. Get your mind in God and walk with Jesus. Can you say amen? So the Holy Spirit's job is to clean all that up, filter all that, point us to Christ, help us to relate to our Father, and be trained how to walk in the kingdom of God. Somebody say amen. All right, so let's go ahead and read our scripture behind me. We're going to go to John 14 first, verse 26 and 27. Are you like me? Sing your heart out. Then when you go to preach, your voice sounds a little hoarse. Amen. So look what it says. Now, there's a word that I won't bring up in the Greek. I will probably next week. But the word means helper or a counselor. It carries a lot of those connotations. So it says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Who will? Okay, now listen. I'm teaching you the word, but the Holy Spirit's using my mouth and my lips to give you the word to open the word up to your understanding. In each believer, you have God in you. He already is the truth. He already knows the truth. He will go bear witness inside of you. When you hear the word outside, he will bear witness inside, and the witness of Christ will confirm and strengthen you. So it's always good to get under the word of God, to listen to the word of God, and to listen from your spirit man, and not from your intellect. Everyone look at your neighbor, and and say, you know, I know you're smart, but you're not that smart. So he says, look it. He shall teach you all things. Now, the all things is not everything. It's the all things in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, that pertain to life and godliness. It's the all things that become new. It's the all things of God that he's placed in you. Can you say amen? Besides that. He will teach you all things. So the Holy Spirit is here to reveal the secrets Satan doesn't know. So you have the prince of this world had known how God works and operates. Satan, we're talking about the devil here. He would have never crucified Jesus because Jesus was a trap. He came to trap Satan and to break his power because he was going to go through the universe with our authority he stole from Adam. That's another story we'll talk at lunch. All right, so all things, okay? And bring to remembrance. Everyone say, I need help with remembrance. Bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. That's why God wants you looking in the Bible, and especially the New Testament, to see the words of Jesus saying and speaking. The words of Jesus saying and speaking. The words of Jesus. Above everything else, just get those words in you so you can see the picture of the entire kingdom of God. It's beautiful. It's like your mom's yard. Now, he says, verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Then he says this, because this is where Christians happen to be. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, let me just say this to you. All fear comes the, from not knowing and it's in the physical realm. We like to define fear as false evidence appearing real. F-E-A-R. It's Satan's lies making them so real, or maybe a situation, but he says it's never going to work out. If you embrace that kind of thing, you're going to be fearful. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. And he's 
given that in us. Let God in you take over your thinking, over your speaking, over your walking. Someone say amen. Now drop down to John 15 verse 26. Gives us another description of what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do. And God told me to emphasize this point, so I will. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of what? So the Holy Spirit's only going to teach you the truths of God. And if somebody comes to you, listen careful, he's going to tell you if they're lying or not. Oh, mothers. Oh, brothers. Oh, family. Wouldn't be that nice when somebody, and some of you already know, the Holy Spirit hates lies. Hello? And so when somebody's conning, the Holy Spirit goes off in me and says, they're not telling you the truth, but I never show it. I said, well, what do we do? I go back and I talk to God. What do we do about that? And he says, well, just pray that they'll learn to start speaking the truth because they're afraid. They're afraid. They're trying to protect their life. And I said, if they try to protect their life, they will lose it. And if they try to hide their stuff, I'll expose it. But if they just come to me and expose themselves, naked and true, well, the Spirit of God will take them and cover them with my robes. Hello. Isn't that beautiful? Cover you with the robes of righteousness. Amen. So listen, the next part says, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify. Here's the point I want to make. He will testify in me. I'm going to say this to you. Never forget this. We are to focus on Jesus, the Father's son. Why? He's the focal point. He's the bullseye. He's what we're aiming towards. Can you say Amen. Well, what about the Father? Oh, you never leave the Father out. You mean to tell me if, if I'm aiming towards Jesus, I'm including the Father? Yes. And if I'm aiming towards Jesus, want to be with Jesus and talk to Jesus, am I including the Holy Spirit? Yes. You can't disconnect any of them. They're all connected. There isn't anything that operates within the kingdom that all the Father, who's above all, through all, and in us all, is not in charge. Hello? And so when you are walking and you're facing and you're focusing on Jesus, which is something that the Holy Spirit's job is, to keep us on Jesus. Why? Why keep us on the trail? Why keep us on the, the way? Why keep us on the way? Because we wander off. Tina, we have a tendency to wander off. Thinking we got it. We've got this now. Come on, laugh with me. I'm that way too, just in a pastor sort of way. Hello? Don't wander away. Stay with Jesus. I've taught you as long as you've known me to meet with God daily so that you don't wander. So your mind doesn't go off in la-la land. Who needs that? My goodness. I had a lot of that when I was a hippie. Let's go down. Now, this is a cool one. John 16 all about the Holy Spirit, verse 12 through 15. Thank you for everybody tuning in. Somebody just tuned in. God says he's going he's gonna to break through right now. He's going to take care of that. So that's your word in Jesus' name. All right, John 16, verse 12. I still have many things, Jesus said, to say to you. Let's make that modern. Has God said everything he's going to say to you yet? So there's many things that God wants to say. You know what I found in my humble walk? There are times I'm not mature enough to hear what he wants to tell me at this point. Doesn't mean he won't or he's keeping it from me. Jesus is saying, look, I want to tell you a whole bunch of things, but you're not going to get it. Have you ever felt, now let's be honest, sometimes we just don't get it. That's because you're not at the right part to get that. So stop striving to get to know something. Start loving God and being with God, and he will reveal it to you. Remember, it comes through revelation, not, I got to know. Anything that you sweat at is you're too much involved with. What do you mean? I'm not supposed to sweat? Listen, you're not supposed to stress. Sweating is okay if you're sweating for the glory of God. <laughs> But if you're out sweating the fact that you haven't paid your bills, sweating the fact your children haven't all come to the Lord yet, 
then your eyes have slipped from heaven down on the, on the physical. And, and it's okay because we need to take a glimpse once in a while. But please don't live on what you just see alone. Come on, wave at me. How many know that we're not supposed to walk by just what we see alone? And walk by just what we hear alone? We're to walk by faith. And you see, there's the problem. We keep switching back and forth. And we don't mean to. We're learning. We're growing. The seed's developing in us. Yay! Amen. And so let's finish 16. It says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you. When you're guided, that means you're on a tour. You'll find this also in 2 Peter chapter 1. He will guide you into all truth. You don't have to Oh, God, please show me the truth. Uh -uh. He'll show you when you need to know. And sometimes he shows us, but we're ignoring him. Like if somebody, maybe, now listen, this happened to me. There's been people in my life that I shouldn't have allowed in my life. For some reason, I was blind to something. But my discerner, God in me, went off and says, you're not to really get around that kind of person. Did I listen? Probably not. I didn't. And so now I listen to things like that because I know God is never wrong. Say with me, God is never wrong. He never is unfair. So therefore, if, if he warns you about somebody, that's for your good, not to make a judgment on whoever he's warning you about. Now, if you're getting warnings about everybody, you're out of balance. I had a person come to me and says, man, I'm seeing devils behind every bush. I said, you're way out of balance. I'm like, tell me about your experience. So they got into one of those deliverant ministries. Everything was a devil. Everything was this and everything. And listen, there's devils involved. But listen, Jesus never paid attention to them until they got in his way. I said, Jesus never paid any attention to them until they got in his way and says, you can't go any further. Remember the man at Gadarene? The one that had a thousand devils in them? Jesus, have you come to torment me before my time? Yes, I have. That's my words. So that you do not have to be concerned about the enemy getting you. You need to be concerned about you being stupid enough to listen to a lie of his. Hello? Because he's got a whole mess of them. And some of them sound so religious, so so almost truthful. And we don't want to embrace something that is not the truth. Hello? When you are jumping your car, you don't want to guess at which is the positive and negative. You get the idea. And many Christians today are shorted out. They haven't got enough faith to get healed. They hardly have enough faith to stay with God. And you know, that's not God's best. Because their eyes have slipped onto the circumstances of life. They're into worry and frustration. All along, Jesus says, take no anxious thought about anything. Let me take care of you. And every time you have a care, bring it to me. Cast it over on me so I can carry the care for you. And you're not carrying it around looking like someone that's lost their dog. Moving right along. He will glorify me. See, there again, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will always point you to Christ. Always point you to Christ. Always point you to the Word. And not the Old Testament for a while. Then the New Testament. Why? Because people get lost in the Old Testament. Until you know enough about Jesus, that's your eyeglasses, to look into the Old Testament. Enjoy the Word, but don't try to act Old Testament. I call it Old Testaments, where you're doing the Old Testament. You bring the Lord the neighbor's cat because you had to bring a sacrifice before the Lord. That would be an extreme, wouldn't you say? Laugh with me. Check your cats, Sherry. Make sure. <laughs> I don't have any. Praise God. Wonder what happened. All right, so he will glorify me. He will take what is of mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is to show you everything of the kingdom. Everything about Jesus. So are you hungry for that? 
So let's have an adventure, okay? And finishing with this. Okay, all things that the Father has are mine. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare. Now, the word declare in the Greek means reveal it in such a way that you will not mistake it. Hello? There's no dark areas with the Holy Spirit. He'll teach you in such a way that you'll live it. Can you say amen? All right, let's get into the word. We're going to cover four areas. Number one, the development of the new creation. Number two, how do we grow and stay growing? Some people stop growing for a while. They get stale and stagnant. We don't want that to happen to us. Say amen. Thirdly, growing up into him. Remember, he is the mold. You pour the jello into the mold. You pour the cookie dough into the mold. Cuckoo, 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 cuckoo. Can you say amen? Now, none of us are going to be exactly like Jesus. You're going to be a Sherry Jesus, and, and you're going to be a Piggy Jesus, and a Scott Jesus type. Why? Because Jesus is going to come out before you, and he's going to escort you through life. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me, you know. He leadeth his children out. Hello? Amen. And then, fourthly, ask God to evaluate your walk and growth. I think a lot of Christians miss this. Every day I try to say, Lord, how am I doing? Well, I don't tell God that. I already know how I'm doing. No, you don't. You can't see it from his point. God can see all points at once. He knows the depth, the height, the length, and the breadth. Inside of you, what needs to be developed. The key is to surrender, lay yourself out before the Lord. So that he can literally scrape and pull some of that stuff out of us. Come on. There is, I would venture to say, and I'm just being honest with all of you because I love you, there are things deep down within your soul laminated that haven't come to light yet. And Satan is just keeping it there until that time where you'll snap. We want that washed out before that time. Can you say amen? Have you ever seen somebody snap and go off the wall? Let's go beyond that. <laughs> Are you ready to get in this? First point, the development of the new creation. Now, remember, we're new creation. That term means species. You're a new kind of species that has never existed before. Number one, Adam was a, a, a different kind of creature. I caught my, I'm going to have to learn to tuck this thing in my shirt and go out out of my shirt, and then tuck my shirt in. I mean, it sounds like a deal, doesn't it? Anyway, Adam was a kind of a, he never knew sin. God was created in God's image after his likeness, wasn't he? But he didn't create, but he did have the ability to talk to the animals. He's the first Dr. Doolittle. Did you know? Now listen, I've said this. I hope you listen. Animals are not severed from their relationship with God. Even though they're under the curse and they're affected by the curse of Adam, they're in fellowship with God. Hello? The only people that need to pray are the ones that don't have a direct communication fellowship with God. We need to keep that going. Can you say amen? It's called communication. Now, Adam, before he fell, he was in direct harmony with heaven, the universe, God, not like some food, food spirit. No, God could actually come down to fellowship and take him up into the heavens. Hello? We have an example of that in Enoch. God took him into the heavens. Elijah, God took him in there. Well, Adam had that ability, but then Adam fell, didn't he? And because the nature of sin is Satan's nature, Adam was bound to the planet, could never leave. Why? Because you can't go to heaven unless you have Jesus in your heart. That's the only ticket out of here. And if you want to learn a gospel message, can I give you two gospel messages? When you're sharing Jesus with somebody, say, look, I need to tell you something. They say, well, what is it? 
I said, you're infected with a disease that's going to kill you and make you com completely suffer and completely die. Would you like a cure of that? Well, naturally I would. Let me tell you about Jesus. Wonderful way to witness. Here's another one. I'm going to throw these ideas out so you'll start reaching out to others because people are dying and going to hell. I'm not kidding. It's a very serious thing. Second of all, how many know that if you invited me to your house, even though you love me and appreciate me so much, I would have to knock before you can invite me in. You would have to know I'm there. So I'd have to approach your house and knock. And then I would have to be invited in. Here's a great way of witness. God stands at the door of everybody's heart. You see, and you could just look at him and say, God really wants to come into your heart. And they'll argue and say, well, stop. If I came to your door and you really loved me and you wanted me in your house, what would you do? Well, I'd ask you to come into my house. So there's another little thing you can elaborate on to win souls. Can you write a little letter to the people in your apartment complex? Tell them about knocking at the door? You can. Let's get beyond our ruts and our blockages. Let's get out there and touch lives. And we might just get healed in the process. All right, you ready? Go with me to Philippians chapter 2, the development of the new creation. Verse 12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but also much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, first of all, work out does not mean work out alone. And fear and trembling does not mean afraid. It means out of respect and reverence. That's old English words for respect. You see, what's missing today is people respecting one another. Give them respect even though they don't deserve it. And then get out of there. <laughs> Moving right along. Somebody laughed with that. I, I'm sure they caught that. Are you with me? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. Say, it's God who works in me. Never forget that, see? We forget that. God loves you. He's in you. Let him have control. For it's God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Didn't Jesus say you are the light of the world? Holding fast. Now this is the key where a lot of Christians miss it. Holding fast the word of life. That it may, that you, that I may rejoice, Paul says, in the day of Christ. And that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. I think sometimes Linda and I wonder how many people are actually getting what we preach. We actually wonder it. Because we see them keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's like, didn't they hear? And then one time, I remember a couple of people that I taught and trained, taught and trained. And I think they got Pastor Kerry deaf. Oh, I'm used to it. I know he's going to say. You see, you be careful of that. So they went to another minister just like me, and they heard the same thing, but they heard it through him, and they got it. I don't care how you get it. You see, I'm not, you are not mine. You're God's. I want to give you everything I got. So if you feel like you're getting used to what, what I'm preaching all the time, make sure you're not being deceived. Because everything I say has depth, breadth, length, and width. Because it's God speaking through me. Say amen. And any other good minister of God, by the way. Let's go on. A couple of points. Number one. Okay. Rejoice in that day. Number one. Church, for believers to grow, they have to trust God being at work inside of them. Say amen. They also need to allow God inside of them to work and take control of them. That's what it means to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Two, 
We are his masterpiece, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works and to live a victorious life. There's no reason why, with God in us, we can't live a good life. It's the choices we made in the past. Don't let the devil haunt you with them. And forget those things behind and press on. Let God make your life and restore your life into something you're even pleased about. And he will. That's why I'm here, to encourage you. We're going to do this, hopefully, together. If you don't bail, some people's lives are so shattered, they fall off the ship all the time. And I'm so sad. People have callings in their life. They have great things, but they choose to do their own thing in their own way. Must break God's heart. Anyway, let's go on. Thirdly, so the church, we are to work out our salvation with Jesus Christ in our heart, with God in our heart, with reverence and trembling. The scripture says in Isaiah, to whom will God look? To those that have a contrite spirit. That means a broken spirit. You need God. And those that tremble at his word. That's who God looks at. Peggy, are you in love with God's word? Amen. He loves it. BJ, are you in love with God's word and his spirit? Yes, he loves it. But we need to allow him to develop us. And so people will stop growing when they stop meeting with God. People will stop growing when they stop faithfully meeting with God. You want to meet with God daily, first thing. Tells God you're serious. Puts everything aside. Puts God first. And that tells you God wants to download and get you adjusted real quickly for your day. And you know what it is to be a father and see your children get beat up? It hurts. Don't you think that Jesus is moved with the feelings of our infirmities? Hello? Do you think he's inside of us? He's along for the ride. Let him take over. Take the wheel, Lord. Keep the wheel, Lord. We need to continue to grow. All right. So, point two. How we grow and stay growing. Matthew 11, please. You know this one. I love it. It doesn't stop. You see, we think it's in the time that Jesus said to his disciples, come unto me. all you He's still saying that to us today. And he's saying it to the Christians. I remember about five and a half years now, if I get my, my, my understanding, God started calling me directly more to prayer than ever before. He says, in the last days that the people don't meet with me and stay and get changed by me in prayer, they won't last. They'll go home early because the pressures will be too great. Now, I don't know how many friends you've lost, but I've lost a lot. I had a great Christian brother I led to the Lord. He was one of the sons of thunder, we called him, one of the Randall boys. He was coming to see me, and he died of a heart attack. I missed him. Many, many other friends. I can mention him because he was a sweet friend of mine. He was coming back to get his life right because he was deceived by another teacher. You know, when you tell your congregation if they go anywhere else, you're not saved, that's a real bad thing to say. We'll never say it here. You just go with Jesus. You be with Jesus. Don't be foolish enough, though, if you've got something good, to leave the good patch and go off and see if there's greener hills somewhere else. You'll find out it's the same kind of stuff. But we want the word. Can you say amen? All right. So Matthew 11 says, come unto me. Jesus is still saying that in, in the Greek. says, come and keep on coming to me. All that you get under burdens, labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That means I'll live your life, and you'll live your life yoked to me, and I will carry you through life if you'll follow me. Doesn't mean I will do all your work for you, but you'll do it with my power and not your own. How many say that's a good idea? I'd rather have God's power helping me to drum than me just drumming. And went, Hello? I'd rather have God's power helping me to be a mother or a father than rather than just being a mother or a father. 
We want the God power coming and stranded through our veins. But you always got to create an allowance every day. Yield. Yield. It's like you have a yield. Yield because the fountain's in you. Yield them out. Yield them out. So come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Connect, hook up upon you and learn from me. Didn't say learn about me. He said from me. So the Holy Spirit's job is keep focusing on Christ. We're focused on Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says if we behold Christ in his face and keep on focusing on the upper call, we become changed. Folks, you are a Polaroid camera. You remember those? Point, click, and the film came out in front. Sarah, did you remember those? And, you know, if you were to try to point to the mountain, you don't want to accidentally hit the button and it's pointed to the ground. You're going to have absorbed on that film whatever you focus on. Get it? Don't focus on problems. That's not how a solution comes. Focus on Jesus. Say, Lord, I don't have an answer. And all of a sudden, he'll come. God wants us to give up trying to find it and just say, Lord, I don't have the answer. I need you. Can you do that? Sure we can. When we learn to do that, we yoke. We yoke right up to God. And listen, it's a basic, simple principle. We don't understand it so much now, but back then they took an animal that was trained in the fields how to plow the fields, and they would bring a new animal, because it's youth, it's strong, and they would yoke them to the old animal so that the older animal could teach the younger animal the ropes. But can you imagine the problem if the younger animal always were bucking and kicking and always fighting? So he's yoke. Can't do that to the bigger animal. You kick, it hurts, and you bite, and it hurts. Now Jesus is using that picture for us to yoke up to Jesus in the spirit and learn from him. Learn the ropes of how to walk. You are all not all that. He that thinketh thee stand it, you better be careful lest you fall, it says. So we yoke up, we learn. Elisha followed Elijah and was yoked up to him. And he got a double portion. Are we yoked up with Jesus? Jesus has left the earth, sent the Holy Spirit. Do we have the mantle of Jesus? Do we have a double portion? Yes, you do. Now learn to yoke up with Jesus. Learn from him. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is what? Remember that. If we yoke to him, things become lighter, even though they are burdens. Why? Because you're going through God energy. You're operating in Christ energy. Christ joy, Christ love. Can you say amen? It's through Christ. Not for Christ only. Well, I'm doing these things for God. Well, you look like you've been beat up. What's wrong with that? Now, I went to an exit. Can I tell you a little story? This is a cute little story. Once I got away from our pastor, he retired, went home. 30 of us went into the ministry, and we're all in the ministry today, except for a couple that went home, home to be with Jesus. And one of the wonderful things about is that we learned the ropes. He took us, and he walked us through the ropes. I want to learn to, I want to have you along enough I can walk you through the ropes. You see what I mean? But in these day and age, it's hard to get people really to value things. There's so much information out there. How do I know what's truth or not? Simple. The Holy Spirit knows all truth. He will guide you, always point you to Christ, always guide you north, always put you in that place so that all you need to do is just meet with him and he'll correct every mistake and alter you every day. That, to me, sounds like a good deal. If I can hire me an Uber... And take me somewhere, I certainly would. 
What do you mean? Jesus is my Uber. I get into him, he guides me through life. You get it? Okay, God's you and me. You know what I have to deal with today. And God says, you're not alone, pal. You keep talking like you're alone. Listen to what you say and how you feel. Don't speak it so much. Because how we say it is, when I'm waking up in the morning, man, I got to have God. Are you the same way? Oh, I hope so. I mean, some of us need a real good dose of God to get on, you know. All right, how do we stay growing? Come, stay with God. Yoke with God. All right. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and you'll find rest to your souls. Boy, that's where the problem is. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, please. We're still on that point. How do we grow and stay growing? Galatians 5, 16. Oh, excuse me, 3, 16. That's all right. My eyes are blessed. Okay. Galatians 3, 16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say seeds as a many, but as of one seed, and to you seed, which is Christ. Who do you have in you? You have the seed of Christ. I just want to show you that scripture. He's developing. Can you say amen? Are you going to let him fully develop? I know Christians have been saved 40 years, and they still can cuss, and they still cheat and lie and do all of that. That's not having the seed develop. And so what do you say to a person like that? Say, hey, you love God, don't you? And they said, I do. And you know, their life just stinks. You said, well, you're not letting the seed develop in you. Why's that? Because the old life hasn't cracked away yet. And then leave it at that. God will haunt them with that thought in such a wonderful way that will see my crack off. Remember, the word works. If you speak it in love, it will set people free. Don't be afraid of people's faces, of telling them what's really wrong. If God told you, I want you to say this to them, and you don't say it, and they die the next day, we forget about things like that. God forbid. Matthew 13, look at this. This is the mustard seed. This is how it grows in you too, Okay. Parable of the mustard seed, another parable he put forth saying, the kingdom of God in our hearts also is like a mustard seed, which a man took, Jesus, sowed his word in the field. The field is our life, which indeed is least than all the seeds. Oh, Jesus, that's, how's he going to help my big problem? It's least than all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. So that even the deadbeats and the know-nothings want to come around and hang on you. Got some money I can borrow? <laughs> you, know the, you know the phrase. So here's this great godly kingdom seeds developing in you. Are you going to get sidetracked and keep it from developing? Are you going to continue to be faithful, consistent, and thankful. Watch that seed develop because it will, God will so develop in you that it'll become like a tree. The power and the glory of God. See, I don't have to move in the power. I just let the power move. It's in you. You're connected to heaven. You have Jesus. You bridged that connector. You said, Jesus, come in my heart, and you just now been accepted of the Father. You're connected. You have an umbilical power cord that comes from heaven right down up through inside of you. It bubbles forth waters and rivers of living life. Now let it out. I know I look mad, don't I? Let it out. People used to just ooh and ah. I used to show them how to let it out, blow people right over. You know, and I was so impressed with that. God, that was pretty impressive. And the devil says, yeah, you can go start a big ministry. No, thank God I didn't do that. But funny thing, I found other people were doing that too, Peggy. Benny Hinn. 
He lined people up, blow them over. I never knew Benny Hinn. I was doing that before I ever met Benny. Why? Because I had a pastor who taught the power of God, taught us how to walk in the power of God, walked us through it with us. You have one too, if I ever see you enough. Moving right along. So the mustard seed takes over in your heart. A couple of points. Church, how we grow and stay growing, listen, is up to us. First, we have to come to him and ask him to develop us and develop us into what he supposed and purposed for us to be. Say amen. The full seed needs to develop in you, so you need to get yourself in the presence of God as often as you can, worship be thankful, open up to God. Why? Because he develops the seed. No one else can develop the seed in you. It's not anything we do, anything we say. It's allowing God to have his way. Second of all, we as believers must diligently seek him. We need to believe that he is daily. He is. He's not, oh, Lord, come and touch me. Where are you at? Oh, hold my hand through life. Well, you think about that, that's sweet, isn't it? I want God to do more than hold my hand. I want him to take over. Wave at me. So when we sing a lot of that, sounds good, clappy, clappy, and, and that's wonderful. But, but I don't like unbelief. After a while, when you walk with God as long as I have, you hate unbelief, anything that has to do with bad confessions. And just like it's going like down the blackboard because it's going directly perverse to the kingdom of God. So my, my prayer, my desire for you, because I love you so much, is so it gets you so in tune with God. And it's not hard. It just takes consistency. Get into it with God so that life is more of a flow. Even when you are challenged with things that pop up, these are not a challenge to you. They are a canvas for God to put you and cause you to overcome. See, how we look at things. Has our mind gone away from a vast, powerful God and down upon, oh, if I just should have, could have, would on the earthly plane? I call it an earthly plane. It says that set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. In other words, so there must be a theater of attention that the earth tries to take us away from God. Huh? And fourthly, developing spiritually is done only by God. Say only by God. So if you're never with God, oh, you're aware of them, you're walking around in them, but you're never having a face-to-face intimacy. You're never going to develop inside. Now, here's what I know happens. It's just like scuba diving. I like to snorkel. I now swim in circles. But when I snorkel, when you go down deep, you ever notice the pressures become strong? You have to stop, grab your nose, breathe a little bit, and, and pressurize yourself for the depth that you go. Now, if you don't know that, that's what you have to do. Well, our spiritual walk and the times we live are just the same way. As we advance towards Jesus' coming, the pressures of life are going to go out of control. Everything's broken, everything. So that pressure is going to come on the physical, the natural man. That's us. But the spiritual man needs to go to God and get his spiritual muscles developed and exercised so that the pressures of this age, this time period, don't overcome us. Say, tweet, tweet. That's exactly what's going on. And you'll see a great falling away because the church is not meeting with God. They are now. Lots of them are. But many who are not are falling away. They can cuss like the rest. They act like the world. And they, and they might say, oh, I love Jesus. But Jesus is not going to say, I didn't know you. He's not going to say, I throw you away. He's just going to say, you don't have any rewards. You never made an effort, never tried. You still accepted me, and I'll accept you because you did. See, God accepts all that accepts him. He might not condone what they do or don't do. But remember, he's after your heart, not your flesh. So you're going to run into a lot of Christians are terrible examples. 
and there. How can you tell them between them and the devil? I've never been hurt so bad in my life, but, but from other Christians. Now, now it doesn't bother me because I know what they can do. <laughs> but it isn't that at all. I don't look at them for that. And you know, can you imagine a young minister? I was 24 when I started in ministry. How, how it could be devastating to see people and keep your eyes on the physical realm. And Jesus says, no, look up. Look to me. Look to me. You're growing up in a mold unto me. Look, I have something greater. Hello? He says, look up from whence cometh our help. All right. Point two, we as uh, believers are must diligently seek him. And people are not doing that. They need to do that more. So let's go to our next point. Growing up into him the same image. Ephesians 4, please. You know the scripture, verse 11 through 16. I'm going to read it quickly because it's long. And it says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, talking about Jesus himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping, to equip you, to make you ready, to equipping of the saints for the work of the, you see, you're to, to be in the work of the ministry. Your job is to fill this church. Invite, 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 until they can quit bothering me about it. Your job is to fill these pews and not sit here and eat this steak dinner all by yourself. And if you don't do that, you're going to get stale because you can even still get sick over steak. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. You see, Jesus is the focal point. The focal point. Amen. Unto a perfect man, to the measure, the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. How's a child? Tossed to and fro by every wind, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Doctrine means teachings. You might go to three Bible studies, but are, are they teaching the same Jesus? Make sure. Otherwise, get as much word as you can. But when somebody's teaching and they're telling you, oh, the church you're going to is weird, and if you ever hear me say this, tell me this is wrong. If I ever tell you that church is weird without the evidence, you see, our job is not to do that. Find out if it's somebody you can learn under and grow, grow, grow however you can grow. Say amen. But you've got a good house here. That we no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, trickery of men, Cunning, craftiness, and deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth to one another, you may grow up in all things. What all things? All things that pertain to life and godliness. Into him. Notice in all things into him. We're growing up into the mold of Jesus. Who is the head? Christ. And from the whole body fitly joined together and knit where every joint supplies. See, you are needed just as much as I'm needed. We're all needed according to the effective working by which part, every part does its share. Are you doing your share in the church here today? Amen. Causes growth of the body of the edifying of itself in love. Folks, we haven't grown very much. So we might be needing to practice what we just read. Hello? And you know, when you invite people, all they can say is no. No. Don't let it bother you. I said no many times. Now look at me. Second Corinthians, go with me. Chapter 3, verse 17 and 18 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is present with us, came at day of Pentecost. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? So when we come to sit under Jesus, there's so much freedom, you can receive any kind of healing that you want. You just got to believe for it. All things are possible to them that believe. Trouble is, 
We get so distracted. You've got to get up and have another cup of coffee and so you miss something merely precious in the sermon. Hello? Priorities, distractions. You're learning about yourself. It's amazing. But we all, now in the presence of God, we have an unveiled face. In other words, nothing blocking our vision. Beholding in the mirror the glory of the Lord. We're sitting in it. We are being transformed into the same image. What image? Jesus. From glory to glory, you see his growth. You see in Jesus, and next thing you know, tomorrow get up, go to church, and you see more of Jesus. And you're growing from glory to glory, from faith to faith. Remember, we grow and stay growing by our exposure to God. A couple of points. Number one, we are to focus on Jesus Christ. He's the model for everything. Focus on him. He has the answers for everything via the Holy Spirit. Two, we are like a Polaroid camera now. Do not focus on problems. If you are like me, when something bothers me, I used to say, oh, man, that's irritating. That just bothers me. And I start talking about it. Guess what happens? I get more bothered. So don't feed fire to the wrong fire. Don't feed fuel to the wrong fire. Are you still with me? Thirdly, we are to grow up into him, the chief cornerstone. He's our model. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And fourthly, Christians will only grow and develop. Now listen, you can only grow and develop according to your surrender. For example, let's say there are some areas in my life, I come right up to these blockages and I seem to just can't get through them. What should I do? Relax. Stop kicking around. Stop analyzing it. And say, Lord, you're going to grow me right up past that blockage if I would just relax and let you take me through it. Say amen. But what do we do? We start kicking and we start popping, right? Amen. God has told us and warned us about our mouth. But we have every kind of comment that we shouldn't be commenting. Blockage. It's go away. It does. You have not the right, even if you are 101 years old, to come against human beings that are made in God's image. You cannot comment negatively. If you don't like it, just say, you know what? I don't appreciate that. And go on past that. Because what Satan knows is if you speak Long enough and negative, listen to me carefully, you'll set a law in motion that'll be hard to break through like cement. Hello? And that's why you hear Paul saying, don't let your conscience be seared with a hot iron. Because some people just won't deal with their life. They just keep going and they're establishing laws. So this never can really break through that cycle. And they keep coming around to that same cycle, coming around. That's a key to you that you're not pursuing God hard enough to break you through that. You're focused on the bondage and not letting go your bad lips. Come on, I used to have terrible gossip. I get mad at somebody and I talk about them for a week. Now, I, I thank God you were saints. None of you have ever done that. But I want to tell you about my life so you can identify that what we say, we're going to have to give an account. And there are spiritual laws that are working that we need to break through that are been banded on us by the devil. Break that because you're in the freedom of the spirit. Can you say Amen. We can only grow and develop in direct proportion to how much you pray and surrender to God. If you're not surrendered to God, say, Lord, if there's something in my life that's resisting you, God, I surrender to you. Just say it out loud. I surrender. I don't know what it is. I surrender to you. It's a great thing to fall into the master's hands. 
But if you won't surrender, I don't care how much you know, how much you pray, God will only bring you up to where you haven't surrendered. And that's growth. You're growing up in, um, so don't panic. Um, today I was talking with a friend, and he said, um, am I losing weight and everything? I seem to stop. And then you'll go and then stop. Is that normal? Yes. Stop looking at it, though, because it makes you want to wonder if that's normal. And that's a distraction in itself. Well, how can I catch all this? How can I catch all this? Well, you can't, you goof. How can I, how can I, how can I, how can I? Just stop and love God and let him bring you up through it. Can you say amen? Say amen again. It's the struggling. How many here has ever cleaned a fish? And you got a, quite a big one and it's flopping around. First thing you want to do is you want to knock it out or kill it so you can cut it open and gut it out without it flopping around, getting guts everywhere. Well, God is gutting you. He's trimming you back. Stop flopping around. My advice is, as a pastor, learn the peace of God. Learn to be consistent and don't be in a hurry to get involved with things you shouldn't. That causes you to flop around and stop you. It hinders your growth. It hinders our growth. And we don't want to be gro growth hindered. Hello? I don't want to be 50 years in the Lord and act like a, a teenager who doesn't know much. Church is filled with people like that. Let me tell you about Jesus. And they got a beer in their hand, a joint in their mouth, and he's a wonderful man. <laughs> yeah. Have you met him? Oh. Anyway, I was kind of hamming it up there for a minute. I remember years ago, can I tell you another one? Years ago when I led all the, I lived in Prairie Ridge. In Prairie Ridge, um, I was raised with my parents, wonderful parents. And I got saved. God saved me and everything. You, got, you know some of the story. I hope you, you learn and talk to me about my background so you can represent me properly. I got saved, but not only did I get saved, but I started sharing to all my hippie smoking friends. They all got saved too. The whole half of Prairie Ridge, which has three or 4,000 residents there, got saved. Now, did I do that? No, but I did share my testimony, my excitement for what God has done in my life. Well, what are you saying, Pastor Kerry? Well, I'm saying that you can't run on what God is doing and trying to make, do all of this without keeping your relationship up with God. And so, boy, you know what they did? I, mean, I became a pastor and I, a teacher. I could teach hours on nothing. What do you mean? I only knew a little bit about God, but I could teach it for hours. I'm trying to tell you about growth. We grow. And so, listen, don't try to teach anything you don't know. Always, when you're sharing Christ, share with what God is doing in your heart if you're young. Then as you study, and as we study together, you'll grow up into him. You'll begin to understand how the kingdom, there's certain principles of do's and don'ts that you shouldn't practice, but not commanded not to practice. See, God gives you a choice even to sin if you want to. Only a ding-dong would. Most of the time, we just slip. Moving right along. Let's go to our next point. Asking God to evaluate our walk and growth. Everyone go, ooh. Now, see, if we evaluate ourselves, sometimes we're harsh. Sometimes we ignore. You know, I'm king of denial. I deny this, deny that. I think we had one of those in office, just resigned, thank God. And then listen, we need to ask God to evaluate us. Now, how many know God loves us? So he's going to evaluate us. He's never going to condemn you. He's never going to put his finger on you unless you are rebellious. And he's always going to help you. He's your father. 
Now, Hebrews tells us that there are Christians who don't let God be God to them, so they are like children without a father. Calls them illegitimate. We have a whole bunch of those. They don't have anybody they're responsible to. They don't go to church unless they want to. Their life's a wreck. They still love Jesus, but they don't have any fathering. Do you understand? No fathering. You need, we need fathering. We've had physical fathers have helped us, not being perfect. We need a heavenly father that can help us spiritually. But we have to go to him and allow ourselves to be fathered. Say amen. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at 28 through 32. Asking God to evaluate our walk and growth. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. It's talking about when we take communion. Look at your heart. Make sure you're just not a, a beatnik, you know, thinking that the juice is going to give you some nourishment and you're going to grab a handful of crackers. That's what was going on in the Corinthian church. They were bringing their dinners and their lunches, and they were eating while they were taking communion. communion. No, nope. have you noticed we eat after service? It's a joke. But they were eating during communion. <coughs> so you guys examine you yourselves, he says. Excuse me. So we need to make sure that we're right with God when we take communion. Say amen. Because we want to receive healing. We want to receive all the benefits to manifest them in our hearts. Say amen. So we can't have sin on our heart and take communion without some kind of negative effect. Just think of that. For he eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not understanding the Lord's body. For, for this reason, many are weak. See, many Christians are weak. Many are sickly all the time. You're sick all the time among you, and many sleep. Why? Because they're not taking care, not walking in love. They're not searching their heart, not going to God and asking cleansing every day. And so they hold things up like a bag. And the more you hold things up, you're going to get infected. It will poison and infect you. And you don't want to be infected with any juices from the past. Can you say amen? Bitterness and resentment, getting even. I'm going to get even with them. Sure you are. So we don't, we examine ourselves. So we don't want to be sickly all the time. We don't want to be in trouble. Can you say amen? Look at the next phrase, verse 32. But when we are judged, when God makes sure our hearts pure, and we have been, we are corrected by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So you're going to see Christians in this day and age. You can't tell the difference between them and the world. Unless they open their mouth and say they love Jesus. God says, get away from them. Because they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of change in their life. 2 Timothy. Chapter 3. Having a form of godliness. They got the word eased down, the Christianese words and everything down. But they're drinking, partying, and doing all that kind of stuff. They're living two lives. Stay away from them, it says, because you'll get a bad reputation. And God will not like it. Come out from among them, he said. Be separate. Don't touch the unclean thing. Let me just say, if you're harboring a bunch of stuff you shouldn't, you know, I mean, go to God about it and ask him how he feels about stuff. Now, he's your father. He's never going to condemn you. He's just going to work with you. Say amen. In 2 Corinthians, look at this. Chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves as whether you are in the faith. Are you running around thinking, oh, 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 are you in the faith? First yourselves. Do, not, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? See, Paul wanted everybody to become God-incited minded. This is one of the New Testament revelations but many Christians today, you hear them pray, oh, God, be with me now. Okay, come and comfort me, Lord. Now, these are all good prayers, please. I'm just showing you this unbelief that comes out. 
Oh, God, hold my hand through this problem. And I know you're going to work through me now. Can you imagine the angels going, what does he want? What are they doing? I mean, we're in a live spiritual theater with a real live spiritual devil and his bunch with the angels and the glory of God. And you talk like, come hold my hand. Come on, chuckle with me. <laughs> Sweetie, you not only can have Jesus holding your hand, you can have him in your heart. Would you like that? Yes, I would. Say after me, Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. Forgive me. And what? Look what just happened to you. We forget the main thing. You run around fixing your problems. You forget the lead people who are sitting here in your living room who need Jesus. Say, oh, me. I don't know why I said that, but God directed me, so I'm, I'm going to do it. Examine yourself. See whether you're in the faith. And then Matthew 7, you know this one. This one I always tell people when they want to say I'm this or that. Have you ever had somebody come to you and says, you're one of these? You're a, a, a manic depressant. No, you're one of these. Don't put people in labels and boxes. Know them after Jesus, even if they're not saved. Look at the potential that can be in stock to the Jesus that God wants to them in there. Stop slapping them what they're doing wrong. Start reaching and say, I can see you're lonely and you're broken. I can tell you're hangry. Don't let the people who are all like that control the peace and the love you project in Jesus. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Verse 2, for what judgment that you judge, you'll be judged. You'll put it in that same bondage. And with the measure that you give it out, some people in here, you judge too much. You make comments too much. They're judgments. And it's holding you in a law of bondage. Don't do that. Do not comment what the world is doing and the problems of the world. You start talking more about Jesus. Can I have a big amen? amen. My goodness. That's, call, that's calling a dog a dog. <laughs> call the dog catcher if you need to get rid of him. Or give him to Sherry. Joke is joke. She's up in arms now, going to come after me. And her mom's going, no, no. I love you guys. I get to go on a little vacation. But that's not the reason why I'm happy. I'm happy, you know, when I pray for all of you in the morning, I do. I pray for all of you, your families and such, not to be a brag. I just know that the exposure to God, if I go through all of you, I'm going to be in God's presence at least two hours. And that presence changes me. It changes, will change anybody. But you've got to surrender to do that. Now, I know some of you can't do that. We're not to compare ourselves. But listen, I think you can do a little bit more than you've been doing. What do you think? Come on. Now, if you're already doing good, be wonderful. Ask God to show something else, but he's not going to eat up your time. Now, here's how the devil plays. If I give time to God, then I'm not going to have time to do my stuff. The devil always plays one in against another. Haven't you figured out? That's all he knows. One team against another. One person against another. One thought against another. This is the way I think. What do you think? And nothing agrees. He does that. That's called divisiveness. Dividing. Don't do that in your conversation. Don't make a person choose against another. That's evil. Evil. It's what Satan wants. Oh, spend some more time with me. I'd love to spend time with you, teach you one-on-one. -on -one. Can you spend a couple of weeks just sitting around and learning about Jesus? We have the place for you to come. Yeah, let's move on. Then I look, look at the next verse, verse 3. And why do you look at the speck 
in your brother's eye. We can't be always pointing out people's sick and they got hurt. Those are specks. Point out they love Jesus. They want Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? Don't look at people's faults. They got lots of them. Why? When, have you noticed your own lately? Has God put his finger on and said, hey, you've been stretching the truth a little bit lately? Has he said anything like, something like similar to that? Don't be going on thinking you're just fine. Stop. Have them evaluate you. That means why you do things, how you do things, but when you're in his presence, it's not a reasoning. It's an evaluation. Say amen. He's going to give you your report card. Did you know you have a daily report card? He reports. Hello. If you come to him, you get all A's. Because he doesn't look at your works. He looks at your heart in the work. He doesn't look at what you do. He looks as your heart in what you do. So if you're making, we'll use Scott. If he's making a beautiful part and he makes wonderful parts. Everybody that's watching, order parts from him. If you make a beautiful part. His heart is in the beautiful part, you see. God looks at that. He doesn't look at just the beautiful part. We are trained that, that if we do good, we're happy. We don't do so good, we're sad. You've been trained that. That's not the way it works. God is after your heart. And even if you made some effort, it's like a child. Oh, man, look at my kid. So he never has any negative stuff that we have been exposed to when it comes time with us. God deals with us in perfection, in good ways. All right, and finishing with you. Bless God, he's finishing. So don't look at others. Look at them and love them. I tell you, I used to get, my heart used to get broken when people would stay home and not come to church, and they would do it just because they wanted to. Break my heart. Somebody would say to me, oh, it's really hard, isn't it, Pastor, to be in the ministry? No, it's not hard at all, because God's running the show. A show? That's right, it's his show. It's all about him. He has the stage, even though he uses somebody like me or you, he has the stage. Can you say amen? And it's what we take home and practice is what we are, not what we just hear. It's what you take home from what you hear and practice. Every day, practice the word. Practice your prayer. Practice releasing God. Practice praying for your dog. Practice on little things and big things. Hello. Praying for your neighborhood. You drive through, you pass your neighbors, start claiming their souls and their salvation, sending the angels. Come on, be creative and stop wasting so much time. He says, how can you say to those that you see everybody else's fault, let me remove the fault from your eyes because we're always offering somebody's advice on what they need to fix. No more. Offer them the word to have them make the choice. I think you ought to do this. Well, we know they should, but how we deliver something, has the seed has to go in their heart. And I'll finish with this up. My words are seed. So if I slap you before I preach to you, are you going to receive the word? I watched a preacher. He's a, he's a wonderful missionary man. And he's, God has a gift of miracles in him. First thing he does is get out there and he says, you guys are all in unbelief. And he slaps them. Yeah. And I go, whoa, 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 what's wrong with you? You don't slap people because the outside person is what you've got to soften to get the seed past their flesh. Hello? And God doesn't slap his kids around. So what am I saying to you? When we share Jesus, be kind. Be courteous. Be respectful. Share with the illustrations about standing at the door and knocking. They have a disease and you have the cure. His name is Jesus. Start sharing with those simple things terms. You'll be surprised how many God will bring your way for you to lead to Jesus. Did you get something out of that this morning? Give the Lord a praise, will you?